On June 21st, 2016, after a long, tumultuous, and disillusioning development, Mighty No. 9 landed onto consoles and computers across North America. Its announcement three years earlier sent out a shockwave, leading to the project becoming the most successful video game on Kickstarter at the time. And how could it not? Here was Keiji, the father of Mega Man Inafune, fresh off of a legendary career at Capcom, pitching what was essentially the second coming of the Blue Bomber, the beloved character who had all but been abandoned by Capcom since his exit. So, how could a project with this level of talent, a budget over four times its original goal and delivered 15 months late, be so mismanaged and produce such a mediocre product? Well, this is Past Mortem, where we break down and explore the stories of video games, and in this episode, we cast our eye to the Mighty No. 9 Kickstarter. Before now, we had wondered why many outlets had not done a big breakdown of the Mighty No. 9 campaign. Now we understand. It is not possible to overstate how deep and murky the facts are, so get equipped. It's about to get rocky. Let's start with a little backstory about the man at the center of it all, Keiji Inafune. Keiji Inafune started at Capcom in 1987. Mostly known as the father of Mega Man, he rose through the ranks on the successes of Onimusha, Resident Evil, and Dead Rising. In the years before Mighty No. 9, he also became well known as a vocal critic of Japan's sagging video game development scene. In 2010, after a promotion to the head of Capcom's R&D, he left a few months later and started two companies, Comcept, a company that develops ideas for multimedia projects, and Intercept, a more traditional game development company. On August 31st, 2013, at the Penny Arcade Expo in Seattle, Washington, Keiji Inafune put it all on the line, the Mighty No. 9 Kickstarter. And people went bonkers! The project met its $900,000 goal in just two days, and would hold the record as the most successful video game on Kickstarter until Bloodstained and Shenmue 3 two years later. All told, Comcept raised over $4 million, including extra donations to their PayPal. They had the funding, they had the talent, they had a passionate community behind them, Fangamer was handling merch, Inti Creates was developing the game, Two Player Productions was making a documentary, it seemed like the surest thing imaginable. Even certain YouTube personalities seemed convinced that the future was bright. Mega Man can hang up his helmet because we don't need him anymore. Wow, that's embarrassing. <laughs> Can't imagine how embarrassed that guy feels right now. Whew. So what the hell happened? Well, the short answer is wildly unrealistic ambition and a profound misunderstanding of the importance of communication. But of course, the devil's in the details. Let's break it down. Of course, hindsight is 2020, but the signs were there from the beginning. First off, the 4 million raised actually boils down to 40% less, something closer to 2.5 million after Kickstarter and PayPal fees. It's worth noting that Yacht Club Games, the makers of Shovel Knight and advisors to Inafune on how to successfully run a Kickstarter, raised only a fraction of that. And we must make note that it was the enticing stretch goals that pushed the grand total to record-breaking heights. And a handful of these were made on the promise of ports. When the campaign wrapped, Mighty No. 9 was set to a appear on no fewer than 10 different platforms, including the PS4 and Xbox One, which hadn't been released yet. But otherwise, things started off strong. Comcept promised at least three updates a month and even held competitions for various design choices, such as the appearance of Beck's sidekick, Call. However, issues with communication and messaging would begin to show as early as December 2013, just three months in. In an effort to strengthen relations between fans and developers, Comcept hired a community manager, Dina Abu Karam. Abu Karam wound up being a controversial hire. Just for context, this was just as Gamergate was about to get going into high gear. After Anita Sarkeesian's 2012 Kickstarter, but before the 2014 campaign against Zoe Quinn. The backlash started because of a gender swap fan art Abu Karam drew of the main character Beck just before her hire. Abu Karam was one of the first supporters of the Mighty No. 9 Kickstarter, largely because she was already friends with people working on the game. Although she had never played a Mega Man game before, she saw an opening for the position, and was hired as both the community manager for the Mighty No. 9 project and as a junior designer at Comcept. It's important to stress that she was qualified for this position. Abu Karam was a trilingual Lebanese transplant freshly graduated with a Master's of Fine Arts from Kyoto University. Besides her previous experience in games and graphic design, she had an incredibly valuable skill for a Japanese company looking to produce a game kickstarted in the West, fluency in both English and Japanese. Some supporters were outraged and became convinced that she would change Mighty No. 9 to promote what they perceived as a radical feminist agenda. While it was far-fetched to think that Inafune would so quickly give the keys to his prize project to a freshly graduated new hire, at the end of the day, this was a Kickstarter that was traded largely on nostalgia and community outreach. People were offended that an apparent outsider had been given power over them. 
The blowback was so bad that Mark McDonald from 8-4 Limited, the game's localization team, had to step in and explain that she was the community manager, not a designer on the game. In fact, it's likely her design work was instead focused on Comcept's smaller-scale mobile games. It's certainly telling that neither Inafune or anyone from Comcept proper stepped in to clear the air. According to Abu Karam, top brass at Comcept were aware of the situation. It's possible they decided not to interfere because they didn't fully understand the seriousness of the backlash, leaving Abu Karam instead to her own devices. Amid claims that Abu Karam was abusing her power and locking threads critical of her, some backers were upset enough to reportedly cancel their Kickstarter donations, though actual amounts lost are not verifiable. After some initial drama, the Kickstarter settled down without much public incident. Comcept maintained their promise of three monthly updates, but confusion ramped up again on the eve of the one-year anniversary. July 2014, at LA's Anime Expo, Inafune not only announced a Mighty No. 9 animated series, but that they were also opening a new round of funding on PayPal in order to raise $100,000 to include English voice work into the game. It was also an attempt to reach out to so-called slacker backers and give people who missed the Kickstarter a chance to place their support. At the same time, they launched another campaign with Japanese crowdfunding site Makuake to fund Japanese voice acting for the same amount, effectively trying to raise $200,000 total. There was some grumbling, but overall this didn't seem to burn much goodwill with the community. But the timing and messaging did create confusion about what exactly this additional round of crowdfunding was for, including if it was for the anime itself. Concern spread through the community. The game proper was still at least a year away, and though Inafune had never shied away from his ambition of a Mighty No. 9 media empire, it still seemed like a premature time to be expanding the franchise, but still, most trusted Inafune. Yet the community wasn't too keen on funding the project much further. By October, this push for voice acting raised a scant $20,000, only 20% of their goal. After an apology from the mighty team, Concept announced that Inafune himself had decided to divert $80,000 raised from people upgrading the rewards on Fangamer to fund the voice acting. However, they could only now afford one round of voice acting. The language was put to a vote, Japanese versus English. A week later, winning by a narrow margin of 5%, it was announced that English would be the default spoken language language for Mighty No. 9. Just two weeks later, on October 30th, a new call for funding went out. A potential bonus DLC for backers, with a new character, Ray, an obvious nod to Zero from Mega Man X, and Boss Stage. The price? $198,000, roughly the cost of one of the last few stretch goals. This would technically be Comcept's third plea for additional funds. It's a tough pill to swallow, coming from a project whose then still record-breaking success was made on the promise of heaps of additional content. Extra end stage and boss, intro stage and boss, call stage and boss, and now zero stage and boss? It rang especially tone deaf when the previous pleas for extra funding fell well below the goal. From here, communication between the community and Comcept would begin to crumble. Rewards like wallpapers for 5 bucks a pop were released to entice people to support the DLC campaign, but updates on the actual progress were never included in community posts. While it appears there was a PayPal progress bar, we are no longer able to access it. This push was meant to run until the end of the year, however, in mid-December, mentions of the Ray DLC ceased. Also around this time, community updates were migrated to the Mighty No. 9 website, with the exception of major updates and monthly in case you missed it posts. While this undoubtedly eased the workload of the developers by allowing them to focus on work instead of content for the Kickstarter, it also had the side effect of allowing Comcept to quietly shield some updates from the Mighty No. 9 community at large. Update the Kickstarter, everyone gets an email. Update the website, supporters would need to visit on their own. For example, in April 2015, Dina Abu Karam quietly stepped down as Mighty No. 9's community manager in an update that was never published on the main Kickstarter. Now hang on folks, because we're still just getting started here. This will bring us to April 28th, 2015. It would be a big day for the community, partially because Mighty No. 9 announced its first delay. The original release date was set for Spring 2015, but as the announcement notes, by the time of this post, Spring was already halfway over, so maybe backers would not be so, quote, surprised by the delay. The bigger news? They had officially partnered with publisher Deep Silver and established a new release date of mid-September that year. And that's not all. This partnership promised to make the game even more mighty. Now, not only would the game have English voice acting, but also Japanese and French. Subtitles for days, and incredibly now, the Ray DLC would be included with all copies of the game except non-backer digital only versions. And lastly, Deep Silver would ship physical copies for PC, Mac, Linux, 
Xbox One, PS4, and Wii U. This would be a turning point for this campaign, but not for the reasons people would think. Because while some saw this as a net positive, now the game would reach even more people, others were rightfully miffed. You see, in the original Kickstarter, a physical copy of the game was never in the cards. The most supporters could ask for was an NES-style box with an art book and a digital download. In fall 2014, Comcept announced that backers could increase their pledges through Fangamer to receive the PC, Mac, or Linux version on a DVD for an additional $26 or a decorative USB for $31, $5 more for international backers. But who cares about an empty box and a download code when there's a complete commercial package? With this announcement, backers naturally asked if they could instead opt for the copy Deep Silver was going to ship to stores? The answer? No. And by the way, no refunds. That's right, if backers wanted the Deep Silver version, they can go to Target and buy it like everyone else. Seriously. We reached out to Fangamer for clarification, and they stated that the Deep Silver announcement was a surprise to them as well, though they had no reason to expect to be a part of those negotiations. And again, Fangamer was not able to issue refunds to people who no longer wanted the DVD or USB versions of the game, as all the money from the upgraded pledges went directly to Comcept. This news definitely raises eyebrows, and you'd remember Comcept's claim that they diverted Fangamer upgrade money to fund English voice acting before the Deep Silver deal. Now, we're sure there were legitimate logistical business complications that muddied the water. Still, it's cold comfort for supporters whose patience was quickly running thin. On July 2nd, Comset previewed a trailer for their Red Ash, the Indelible Legend Kickstarter that went live two days later on July 4th. Yes, Comcept launched another Kickstarter before they had even delivered on their first one. Pardon the editorialization here, but this Kickstarter was just terrible. Beyond its launch day of July 4th, a major holiday in the US, the Red Ash Kickstarter was horribly timed and again gives the appearance that Inafune and his camp are truly tone deaf. It was hot off the heels of three very successful retro revival crowdfunding campaigns in the previous two months. I'm talking of course of Ukulele, Bloodstained, and Shenmue 3 that had likely tapped out most of their retro fanbase. Beyond even that, it was also launched the same time as a separate Kickstarter for the anime version of Red Ash, called Red Ash Magic Cicada? Magis... Ma Magis Cicada, okay. I'll go with that one. Magic Cicada. By the way, that Kickstarter was run by Studio 4C, not Comcept, but it was still posted under the Comcept account. Let's take a second and examine these two campaign announcements side by side. Look at how the Magic Cicada pitch gets right to the meat of the announcement, like right away. It even explains there are two different Kickstarters within the first 30 seconds. Now, on the other hand, the Indelible Legacy pitch is... I don't know, it's an, it's an anime? Like, uh, what is this? It certainly doesn't look like a video game. Now, for reference, at this point, it had become customary to at least showcase a prototype in the Kickstarter pitch to prove that you could deliver on your product. We're already one minute in, but let's watch in real time just how long it takes for this trailer to actually explain itself. All right, now he's running away. Oh, watch out, buddy. Don't, don't get hit by the anime monster. He's jumping over the anime monster. Uh, boy, that guy doesn't look like Mega Man. Oh, jump! He made the jump! Good for- Oh, watch out! What a goofball! He made the jump, but he almost fell down. But he did fall down. He can't believe the predicament he's in! Wow! Is this still going? Jesus Christ! Hey, look, it's totally not Teasel. Kept you waiting, didn't- Yeah. I'm still waiting. Oh! Whoa, there's Inafune! Okay, finally, all right. Oh, what are we, three minutes into this video? Yeah, three minutes in, finally. Now, besides the production issues, like recording with what sounds like the onboard microphone and possibly reading off of cue cards, this video fails to address what exactly it's selling. Game design. What about game design? What game? What is the game you're talking about? Action RPG, there it is. Three, almost four minutes in. If you bother to read the description, you can see that this is a grand second attempt at the Mega Man Legend franchise. Though it's unclear what exactly this game is. Like, are we just kickstarting a prologue to the game? Even now, through all our research, we're still not exactly sure what this game is. All right, beyond even all of that, some may be wondering, how was Comcept able to start a new game in the first place? Well, that's because Comcept was technically done with Maya number nine. How is that possible, you ask? That's because Comcept, a portmanteau of concept and computer, is just an ideas house. They make an idea and then farm it out to an actual game development studio. So for the record, Inti Creates and Deep Silver were hard at work getting Maya number nine for launch. And according to Inafune, Comcept was essentially twiddling their thumbs with nothing else to do. This project was intended to keep Comcept above ground since their only other 
their upcoming project, ReCore, had only just been announced at this point. We're explaining this to you because Concept themselves certainly didn't make it clear to their supporters. Almost immediately, it became obvious that the indelible legend was not going to take hold like Mighty No. 9. In an attempt to raise support, they made pushes like releasing a playable demo. However, again in a moment of obliviousness, the demo used Mighty No. 9 characters as placeholders, which irritated Mighty No. 9 supporters because a proper demo of that game had not been released yet. After only a week, Inafune decided to secure money with an outside source because in his words, if we fail at Kickstarter, that's totally fine. We'll find something else. While it's admirable that Inafune was determined to get Red Ash made, it again showcases a complete lack of regard for what failed funding means in terms of audience interest and general goodwill towards your image and products. While the Red Ash Kickstarter was going on, there were rumblings of trouble in the Mighty No. 9 camp. Yes, folks, it's about to get even messier. On July 23rd, retailers were mysteriously changing the release dates of Mighty No. 9 from September 15th to placeholder dates. Rumors of a delay started to spread, but no updates were posted on main Mighty No. 9 channels. According to Kotaku, a mod on the forums said they were informed by the game's producer, Nick Yu, that these rumors were bunk. Unfortunately, this is all fans had to go on at the time. Back in Red Ash Land, on July 29th, Comcept announced that they had funded the Indelible Legend with a little help from Chinese console maker and video game company Fuse Entertainment. This announcement had some backers running for the door, and the Kickstarter ended unsuccessfully on August 3rd. Despite this, at the time of producing this video, the release date of Red Ash is set for July 2017. Incidentally, the anime was successfully funded and appears to now be in production. On August 5th, two days after the Red Ash Kickstarter ended, Comcept confirmed the rumors. Mighty No. 9 was delayed again to an unknown date in Q1 2016. Two days later, Nick Yu released a Q&A claiming that the delayed decision was reached by all business partners involved, Comcept, Indie Creates, Deep Silver, etc., but that the decision had not been reached until a week ago. Obviously, this does not jive with the timeline of when the date started disappearing on July 23rd. The delay was blamed on a bug in the multiplayer, according to you. Though they could have split the multiplayer from the single-player campaign, this would have lowered the final price of the retail version. According to Inafune in a separate interview, this was a decision made by Deep Silver, not Comcept and Inti Creates, for pure marketing purposes. This not only contradicts what you had said earlier, it gives the appearance of Inafune trying to avoid blame and throw Deep Silver under the bus. Weeks later, on August 27th, Comcept announced that as a consolation for the delayed game, they would release the demo previewed earlier at Gamescom to backers on September 15th, the original Deep Silver release date. Then, on September 15th, there was a lone paragraph added to an unrelated art contest update that stated the demo would be delayed because of, quote, issues regarding the distribution method. This update was published on the Mighty No. 9 website, not the Kickstarter, which is odd because the demo was only available to Kickstarter supporters, not the general public. Comcept wouldn't further clarify these statements until a full three days later on the 18th, essentially explaining that they didn't have a distribution platform ready to go before announcing the demo release date. The demo wasn't distributed until September 25th, which coincidentally was the same day they officially announced February 9th as the North American release date for Mighty No. 9. It's becoming more and more difficult not to view these as calculated PR moves to keep the project in the best light possible. Around this time, updates to the Kickstarter and the official website slowed to a trickle. That is until January 25th when we got this kicker. Mighty No. 9 delayed again. This time the date is listed as Spring 2016. The delay was pinned once again on the multiplayer. A bug in the matchmaking and other systems was derailing the experience, but since the team was working on an engine that is no longer supported, they have to manually reprogram every single engine for every single game and I'll get... I don't even care anymore. I I'm done. I'm done. From January, it was radio silence from the Mighty Team until May 2nd, when Inafune announced that the game had gone gold, meaning the final version of the game had been approved for a physical release. Praise be! Oh, but not the 3DS and Vita versions, but still, everything else was locked for a release date of June 21st for North America. The end of the saga was in sight. There's no way that anything else can go wrong. And make the bad guys cry like an anime fan on prom night. Well, god damn it. Uploaded one month before the game's release, the credit for this now infamous trailer goes to publisher Deep Silver. Goodwill with Kickstarter supporters had likely long since already dried up, but for the general gaming public, who maybe did not know the full extent of the project's mismanagement, the game became a laughingstock. But to be fair, even Takuya Aizu, CEO of Inti Creates, was pissed. And we're still not quite finished yet, because the actual launch itself was also pretty messy. 
The Xbox 360 version was delayed for an additional few days, PSN codes didn't come when expected, backers promised a pair of download codes received only one, and there were claims that the Wii U version of the Ray DLC crashed the system and glitched the game. One of our viewers claimed they pledged to receive a decorative statue, and they were told they would no longer be receiving it. When reached for comment, Fangamer said those high-tier rewards were handled by Comcept, not Fangamer. Reviews of the game were not terrible, but many still found it well beneath the level of quality expected. This story is still ongoing. As late as September 6th, there was an update buried within another update, revealing that the DRM-free Mac and Linux versions were finally uploaded to Humble Bundle. Our sources at Fangamer claim they had been waiting on that data from Comcept, but physical rewards are now in production with fulfillment planned for early 2017. Also, as of producing this video, those Vita and 3DS versions are still release date to be determined. We end on the event of the official Twitch livestream on launch day. The stream was not archived, we were not able to find a full copy ourselves, but articles transcribed the many regretful and melancholy quotes from Inafune, translated by his longtime agent and partner Ben Judd. The big pull-away quote, and the only piece of footage we could find, that Mighty No. 9 was quote, better than nothing, was actually the opinion of Ben Judd, but widely misreported as straight from the mouth of Inafune himself. Even if it's not perfect, it's better than nothing. At least that's my opinion. He did place blame on himself though, quote, I am kind of loath to say this because it's going to sound like an excuse and I don't want to make any excuses. I own all the problems that came with this game and if you want to hurl insults at me, that's totally fine. I'm the key creator and I own that responsibility. And that's just it. At the end of the day, it was Inafune driving that bus. Now, it's common to see people online refer to Mina number 9 as a scam or a shallow cash grab. We certainly understand people's outrage, especially those who pledged, but really, I just don't see it that way. Inafune is a creator, not a con artist. This is a classic story of biting off more than you can chew, when one's own ambition gets the best of them. But after this breakdown, there's still one question. How could one of the most agilated video game developers in history, someone who once managed over 900 people at Capcom, take a project this promising and mismanage it this spectacularly? Stay tuned for when we break down the story of the mightiest number, Keiji Inafune. Until then, for Grace Kramer and Derek Alexander, this is Past Mortem signing off. Thanks for watching. If you want more video game documentaries and reviews, I recommend you subscribe and check out some of our other videos. On the left, we explain the fallout between Hideo Kojima and Konami, and on the right, we plot the rise of Dark Souls from Software and Hidetaka Miyazaki. We also have a live stream channel, you can check that out in the middle. Stop Skeletons from Fighting is a Patreon supported show. Super special thanks to all of these fine people. If you'd like to support the show and see your name here, click the Patreon logo and give what you can. Thanks again for watching. And We'll see you again real soon.